organizing teams. And privately, I'm a cyclist. I make bikes, I repair bikes, I ride bikes, I make photography, and uh, also I'm an ultimate frisbee player. If you don't know that game, this is uh, something like Python among the programming languages. The same thing is about ultimate frisbee in team sports. So check it out. It's a great thing to do. So the talk is going to be about uh, how I rediscovered descriptors. And uh, I did it when I was uh, working on tree structures. The, uh, the tree structure, that's uh, basically you have, you have a parent node, you have some uh, fields inside, so uh, well, maybe the other way. So you have many nodes. One can be uh, put inside another, then we call this node a field of, of the parent node. And uh, you can also put value inside the field. So um, the basic tree structure is like uh, in Django. You know the models in Django? Do you know Django? So, um, so we have fields in there. This is one level tree. And uh, what I discovered when I looked, uh, when I was watching the presentation by my friend, is that I think many people have seen the descriptors, have even heard about where they are used but they didn't see the obvious way to use it in other places or to override the de default behavior. So have you heard anything about descriptors? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, and uh, have you ever overridden the default behavior? Well, that's what I thought. And uh, so uh, I'm gonna start with introducing the project to give you some context. I'm gonna tell you about fighting the legacy code and uh, how I, when I got the opportunity, I have rewritten the uh, tree structure that was used over there and uh, what I learned from that. So there's going to be a legacy code ahead. Uh, first, the project. The project was a positioning system. It means uh, we have a mobile phone which sends the uh, GPS position along with what uh, it sees in the radio. So the, uh, what base stations of the cell network it sees. And we process that, we calculate the positions of the radio stations. We gather this data, and then when uh, the, another mobile phone, the, the one down, sees uh, only the, net, uh, the cell network stations, we can give it an approximate position. And this is used in an assisted GPS when you, uh, because otherwise the phone would take like 10 minutes to log onto the satellite because it, it doesn't know anything about the satellites and the receivers are cheap inside. Uh, mobile phones. And uh, that was the C++ project. And we had a test project alongside that was written by a C++ programmer. And uh, this project basically replaced the uh, mobile phones and also had access to database. So we were sending binary data, we were comparing the responses against what we want to see. And uh, we were also checking within the database that the positions are updated in the right way. So that's basically it, and up to the code. So there were a few problems with the code. Uh, we had start imports because the C++ programmer didn't know an another way to deal with the modules. He wanted everything basically in the same namespace. So every package was a namespace of itself and it was importing everything from the submodules themselves. Uh, that's the thing we didn't deal with because the project was used in other uh, areas also. And uh, we had a few things uh, that uh, I think stem out of uh, not having introspection in C++ in such an extent as in Python. So uh, we have uh, repeated names. As you can see here, uh, there are slots that uh, protect us from uh, assigning uh, to the wrong name. Uh, we have uh, an initialization where we call the, the base element and we tell, okay, so under these names we want such fields. And we also give those names of the fields again to the fields themselves. So that's a bit of a hassle. Then again, uh, in the top level structure, we have uh, all the functions defined uh, in such a way that they are manually looking uh, at the tree below and they are doing the printing, the serialization, the, comp uh, the comparing to other objects, and um, that doesn't have to be like this. It can be automated because we can know everything about this data structure. But there is also something very uh, 
peculiar and uh, which I would like to you direct your attention to. This is the Mortal Kombat guy over here to show you. This is the call function. And the call function was used to store the uh, uh, value inside a field. So instead of assigning, where you would lose the field and instead had a, had a different, uh, you would put a, this simple object inside uh, this attribute. We, have, we are calling the field, and this way we put the value inside the field, and the field is still usable with all these methods. So um, what happens when you have a structure like this? So uh, you have to be very careful with references, and so having uh, variables to collect some parts of data and then constructing it, it's, it's rather risky. So all the test definitions were done in long chains of attribute access where the lines were copy-pasted, and it's not very uh, usable. Also, we had another idiosyncrasy from C++ where we used uh, uh, the static methods within the class. So uh, we are basically making a singleton out of a module which already is a singleton. So this is another thing that's funny here. We have some special functions that deal with some of the data, like the set version, we have those calls, as you can see, where the cut is, the second cut, uh, uh, that actually set the data, and, uh, and that's about it. So mm, when you think about such structure and what is your goal when you're doing such test uh, project, I thought my goal was actually to uh, provide for the testers. So they are the guys that are, that are needing my work, and uh, what I wanted to do is, is give them easy to use trees so that they can easily define the data. And that's how I imagined it. So, so I would not have this repetition. I would have a clear structure. I would know which element goes where. And, uh, and when you look at it, because those tree structures were used everywhere, they were used in uh, server configuration, they were used in difference reporting, they were used in feeding data, they were using feeding database. So, uh, so when you look at it, this definition looks very much like an assignment. And uh, so I thought this is the right way to go. And, and I thought, uh, well, I'd like to have something like Django, where you have those fields where you can assign values, but you can still use them and call method on them. So I tried to make it like that. And the first step was to use the keyword arguments. And uh, so I added those keyword arguments into the base element, and I used them everywhere in the hierarchy below. So we have uh, this ABC element, which inherits from base element. And uh, I have keywords there. And uh, the second thing I did uh, is uh, I actually used the printing to give the differences. So I used the diff library to give the reporting to the tester, and this way, you didn't, you didn't have to walk the tree for, for difference reporting. But uh, again, this Mortal Kombat guy shows you the place uh, where there is something interesting happening. So in the init, we call the uh, get at on the uh, item. And then we call it with the value to set up the value. And so we have this um, uh, cooperation between the call in the parent, which is the init one, and the call in the child, which is the call one, which intercepts the value and puts it inside. And uh, so that was the first thing. And uh, pretty uh, soon, the, another protocol came. And I didn't uh, have to deal with the rest, especially because other testers were also using it, not only my team. So what I left there was the start imports. I left the repetition when defining the data. I left the serialization because it was using some uh, C uh, plugin, and I uh, said because the other projects are were using it. Excuse me. Uh -huh. mm. uh, yeah. So uh, next time I had a chance, I, I took the opportunity to uh, actually uh, implement those uh, data structures anew because uh, we had a new protocol to implement. And, uh, and again, I, I was looking at Django and I thought, well, maybe not only the, uh, the initialization can be dealt with, but also like assigning the values to the attributes. So when I assign, I want to the value to get into the field 
and I want the field to be usable still. And so uh, the first straightforward way as I seen it was to use the set at which uh, which uh, I, in which I have overridden the default behavior and I redirected the assignment to the assign method. And so in this place, um, uh, I use uh, so the set at is used in the parent when you access the attribute, and then this assignment is redirected to the child, and uh, this child is dealing with putting this attribute in the right place in the field, and also uh, putting the other fields that can be in the subtree. So we are, I actually had this in two separate classes, but I couldn't fit that in here, so this class is basically both the parent and the node. It, so each node has this uh, ability to intercept the assignment, and each node has this ability to take care of it when it's a child. And so we are taking care of the value and we are taking care of the subfields that are in the, uh, in, the, um, in, the uh, in the child. And another thing I took from Django, I have stolen it, it was the creation counter, uh, which uh, let me get rid of the uh, repeating the names in the slots. So we have a creation counter, we copy it from the class into the instance, and this way we can easily sort the, the stuff. Because as you go, when you define, when you call those classes, instantiate those uh, fields, they each get uh, a creation counter uh, in the sequence like, like the lines go in the file. And uh, so it was almost there. We, uh, it happened to be that actually I invented something like a data descriptors, and, uh, but data descriptors just go in a different way. So I have overridden the set at, at, uh, magic method, and I called assign, and what the descriptors, data descriptors do, they actually have this mechanism within the get attribute, and they use set for setting the value inside the child. So those, uh, those two being set at and assign change uh, the functionality and I, I put them instead. There is a get attribute which would call our uh, set and uh, the set is in, in place of our assign. So, so this is the transformation that happened and basically I'm using the data descriptors. And what I think, this doesn't seem scary. I think uh, people get, uh, get scared because they see this call tree and think, oh my god, this must be complicated. I don't know why is it here. And this is complicated because this is actually few things mixed up together. There is inheritance here, there is descriptors, and there is data descriptors. So the ones in red, and again, I have those, uh, those two matching pairs uh, marked pink. So there is a parent call and there is a child call. And uh, the red ones are the data descriptors. So we are basically checking within the class because we have to do it before we access the, in, uh, the, the field in, of the instance. And if there is a get and set, we call set, and the set is doing our work. And uh, now the green part is basically an inheritance chain. So we take care that uh, we take stuff from the instance, and in case that it's not in the instance, we take care to take it out of the class. And if we take it from there, we check again if there is a get method so that we can override the behavior. And at the end, the white one is a fallback which you can use and which is also quite fine to, uh, to define something like a dic default dictionary with attributes. When there is an attribute missing, you just, uh, uh, you can override the behavior. When, what happens when, when you get uh, no such attribute? And in the, in the default, it's that attribute error that you get. And uh, so after you have done all of this, and then you make an, uh, a structure all inheriting from this base element, you can do things like uh, put some fields in there to give you the ranges for the validation, put some fields to give you default values, and all this is safe from writing when, you are, uh, when we are defining data. So this is a type definition. I, was, I had actually uh, two kinds of 
the, the first split was between the structure and the atom. So the structure was dealing with uh, copying the fields. The atom was dealing with copying the value within the field. So, uh, so the structure was basically like a subtree. The, uh, the atom was like a, like a single element. Within the structure also at least. And then you simply define the data, say something about uh, the max value. And when you have a uint, then for example, you inherit in from int and add the minimum value of zero and so on and so on. And this becomes more readable. But the most important thing is that you actually get this kind of use. That let's look at uh, the, down, uh, the lower part. And uh, you have this ABC element, which has a version, and this has a minor field. So we want to change this minor field, and we don't have to call it. So it doesn't look strange. But you are, when you assign to it, you still can uh, validate it. You can serialize it. And this way, you move all the logic uh, down with the structure. So you only care about uh, what this particular field is doing uh, in respect to serializing. And then the field above is doing, is calling this field to get the serialized data and then construct the bigger parts. So this way you can spread the functionality. And actually, in most cases, you don't have to write it again uh, in, in the fields in those small atoms over there. And uh, so the descriptors are basically that. They are overriding the access to the attributes. And this gives us the possibility to, to put it somewhere else, to put the thing that we are calling it with, like the assignment, somewhere else, and then still use the magic field that has some properties and, and methods to be called. And uh, as a bonus within this project, it gave, it, the structure started looking so easy uh, that uh, I was actually able to uh, redefine the printing in such a way that I was able to print those structures onto the screen. So from the previous situation on the right, where we had a different way of printing and a different way of defining data, we came to the situation that the printing and defining was basically the same. And so we could do regression testings within the project. And the testers uh, got a really big performance boost on that because they were able to copy the structure from the screen and just put it in place, modify some things, and, and test regress regressively. So, uh, and that's about it. So uh, I think the moral of this story is that you can prove anything with a country example. And I like how, it's, uh, uh, how Joel Spolsky put it. And uh, uh, I also look, uh, seen it in the morning you know, on some other talk that there is this Pareto principle. And I wanted to say that too, that you should actually, when you are doing something, you should choose the most bang for the buck and try to uh, not get, get into rewriting stuff until you get to new features, because it doesn't uh, bring business value. And. Uh, and as I did, the, I did the new solutions on new features. So if it's broken, don't fix it. Uh, do you have any questions? I think I, I rushed through it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I still have time. So. Um, so, uh, so the story is first, I, I took care of the low hanging fruit and I put the keyword arguments in there to initialize the value. And then I realized that when you look at the data, it looks pretty much like an assignment. And I wanted this assignment to not only be used in, uh, in the initialization, but also uh, to be able to assign again to that uh, data structure. So when constructing the data structure, I could have some definition, but then I could copy the data structure and then assign again and modify it for some other tests. So have some basic template and modify it, modify it later. And uh, this led me to try to override the assignment, which is basically attribute access plus, plus the uh, assignment. And uh, I tried to do that with the set and assign. And this works, 
but then I realized that actually those things are already there. So the how I think about it, uh, I think the strict descriptor API, data descriptor API, is mostly about this kind of thing where you try to take over at the moment where somebody is assigning to something, then take this data, put it inside the field or a node, and then still have this magic node that does all the work for you, but you have the ability to write the code like, uh, like that, where you assign to something and then call the, the stuff that is needed for you. And, uh, and it, think, it led me to thinking that the descriptors are not very much uh, the, the big call graph over here, but this is only the, the red part which checks if the methods are there and calls them if they are there. So this is the default behavior of the get attribute stuff, uh, get attribute method in Python. And I thought I'd like to share it. No, I, I just called those uh, subtrees, which contained another other fields, which could be also subtrees, uh, struct. So I built a class hierarchy, so I didn't have to re-implement the stuff that would be common, for example, to integers, to numbers, to booleans, and so this, this, these are the atoms. And for the structures, I, by, by that I mean lists, uh, trees, and so here I'm actually uh, showing something that is a, there's a mix of the two because I'm copying over here. I'm copying value, that's what the atom does, and I'm copying fields because I didn't have space and I didn't want to complicate it. So I wanted to say that there is a node, you can put a value in it, but you can also have subfields. And those subfields can all, again be a node, you can put a value there, you can put subfields, and this way you build a tree from that. Uh, hmm? Did your changes have any impact on the performance of the code? Uh, as I said, I think it had a, a big impact on the performance of the team by, by means of this one, uh, where they could actually copy-paste the data from the screen. And I think that was the biggest thing. Uh, from the other stuff, I had also changed the uh, comparator. So where you had the two structures, normally, uh, it was walking down the tree and trying to compare each of them and then said, okay, this is different from that one, but maybe even didn't give the value. So I changed it to such a way that I actually used the printer. I printed the both structures and then put a diff on that and removed all the non-differing lines from the diff, which I don't show there, actually. And uh, this, is, this is a diff. I, copied from the from the code so so these were I think the two biggest improvements the other improvement was about the configuration but this was a bit a bit different tree so so I think it's not related well I no longer work at the company so right now I'm doing web development at STX and this is a much better line of work. And uh, I think we have refined process with a lot of, we have almost 100% coverage. We have uh, VMs to run the stuff. We have a working scrum and I, I think I'm not going back over there to fix that stuff. Anything more? So I guess thank you for your attention. <laughs>